Hi, my name is Daria Mizantsova and welcome to Politica World Show. In today's show, we will talk about the following. Russia is building a vast network of trenches, traps and obstacles to slow Ukraine's momentum in the southern direction. Will it work or Ukraine will smash the Russian army? Ukraine needs urgently more weapons. Can Americans speed up the supply? How can convergence between Europe and US influence the potential of military help to Ukraine? We will talk about it with a military expert and the expert in national security and defense, Luke Coffey. Luke, I'm happy to have you here. Thanks, Daria. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, let's start from the last your trip to Kiev, uh, to Ukraine. So, uh, uh, as our audience uh, is uh, from Europe, from US, could you tell what uh, did you feel uh, when you have been uh, in Kiev the last time? Well, I was um, surprised, pleasantly surprised by the resiliency shown by the Ukrainian people. Uh, you know, even during the airstrikes uh, in, in Kyiv when I was there, uh, you know, pe- uh, traffic was moving, people were on the streets, people were in restaurants and shops. I know that goes against the advice of the government, which is to go to a shelter, uh, but it seems like the uh, the people of Kyiv um, were continuing on very defiantly uh, with their lives. And uh, I, I was really impressed by the uh, the strength and the resiliency of the Ukrainian society. Um, it, so that was the biggest uh, um, takeaway for me on this trip. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm convinced that uh, Ukraine will win this war. How quickly Ukraine wins will be determined by how quickly the United States gives Ukraine the weapons that it needs. Uh, But regardless, Ukraine will uh, liberate its territory, will liberate its land, and defeat Russia on the battlefield. Can Americans uh, um, influence this process, uh, how the weapons uh, uh, come to Ukraine? Yeah, we're trying to. Um, there's a th- there's a group of us here in Washington who are working with the administration, with the White House. We're working with Capitol Hill to try to speed up the delivery of important weapon systems uh, to Ukraine. the The Biden administration has been very cautious, very risk adverse when it comes to providing the weapons to Ukraine that it needs. It almost feels like. There has to be some sort of setback on the battlefield or in the war before the Biden administration will unlock the next level of aid. We should have been giving Ukraine Patriot air defense system months ago. We shouldn't have waited for the latest uh, round of Russian airstrikes, the the ones that began in in November and just continued on, or in October and can, you know, every, you know, almost every week. We should have given Ukraine these uh, air defense systems over the summer or in the spring. Uh, And the same goes for um, F-16 fighter jets or the big uh, Abrams main battle tanks or the Leopard uh, main battle tank from from Germany, for example. We have to want Ukraine to win more than we just hope Russia will lose. And right now we just, we give Ukraine just enough material and weapons so you don't lose. Uh, But we don't give you enough so you can win. And we have to change that mentality. We have to change the way we are thinking. And we also have to prepare ourselves that this will be a long war and we have to support Ukraine throughout the whole process. I remember during the first week of the war in early March, I was talking to a colleague of mine who is an expert on the Air Force. And I asked him, I said, well, what about providing F-16s to Ukraine? And he said to me, he said, Luke, there's no point because With all the training that's required, it wouldn't be until July that they could use these planes. Like he thought the war would be over before then, right? And so he said by July. Well, it's now December. So, you know, had we started earlier, 
you know, Ukraine could be using F-16s, for example. But what is their take right now? I had talks uh, uh, with a lot of the experts. They uh, put uh, it uh, this way. So, for example, they give me three reasons. First reason is uh, uh, spread of nuclear war. Uh, the other reason is... Uh, uh, White House is uh, really slow with uh, pushing uh, all the things around the supply of the weapons to the Ukraine. And next thing is something, some talks, some ramp of talks uh, uh, with uh, Russia that uh, could be done uh, by um, White House. So just uh, what I mean, yeah? So... Uh, yeah. U.S. Uh, tell uh, Russia, oh, we won't supply this, but you want to uh, uh, do these airstrikes. I mean, so what is your uh, what is your theory of uh, why we are not getting everything in time we need? Well, the White House is scared of escalation, but what they don't understand is that what is escalation. What is escalation? Uh, the, the, they're worried that there could be an escalation in the conflict between the U.S. and Russia, that there could be a new that that there could be a threat to NATO. But what they don't realize is that um, Russia has already escalated this war to a very high level. The concerns about a nuclear war, uh, I think, are uh, are unfounded because we we forget we have a deterrent as well. It's not that it's only Russia that has nuclear weapons. The United States also has nuclear weapons. So there is a but deterrence the problem, there. The problem, NATO is, uh, uh, NATO has more force than uh, Russia, as I can understand. Well, exactly. And we, we shouldn't be scared uh, to provide Ukraine with the weapons that it needs. Uh, the Ukrainians are fighting and dying every single day to defend their homeland. And we should be giving the Ukrainians whatever they need. We should not worry about um, how Russia feels about this. Th that should almost be irrelevant. We should start worrying about how Ukraine feels. Ukraine is our partner and our friend, not Russia. And it makes no sense, for example, that Russia can attack anywhere in Ukraine, hit any target, civilian or military, I mean, also when I was in Ukraine, I was in Lviv, and there were airstrikes uh, at that time as well. Lviv is, um, you know, more than a thousand kilometers uh, from from the front lines, and civilian uh, infrastructure was being hit in, in Lviv. But yet we tell Ukraine that they shouldn't use any weapons to attack legitimate military targets inside the Russian Federation. This makes no sense from a military point of view, and, and we have to we have to lose our fear uh, of of Russia. And as I said, we have to start wanting Ukraine to win more than we just hope Russia is going to lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as I know, as many experts uh, tell me, and um, even if we are taking in, uh, into account the last article uh, by Boris Johnson. I hope uh, hopefully you read it, yeah? So uh, it was published uh, recently and he told that we yes, need to ramp up uh, military aid. What he means, as I understand, so uh, uh, U.S. should uh, uh, put the military manufacturing on the uh, war feed, as I understand, yes? Yeah. So, and uh, then many experts told me that uh, U.S. loses even more if uh, Ukraine doesn't advance on the front line. So what do you make of it? Uh, if uh, there are such points, uh, why weapons goes, uh, go uh, slowly to Ukraine? It, well, our America's support to Ukraine has highlighted the shortcomings of our defense industrial uh, base here in America, where all of a sudden we're having difficulty uh, producing, uh, quickly producing uh, certain weapons, certain munitions, certain bombs. And it's a wake up call. And it's, you know, thankfully for America, uh, it was a wake up call that we got in a war that we are not personally fighting in. 
uh, you know, the, Ukraine, you, you're fighting, uh, you're dying every day, you're fighting against the Russians, not Americans. Uh, but even with our support to Ukraine, we're still realizing that we can't produce the equipment and the munitions that we need. Had this been a war between the United States and China, and then we discovered this problem, it would have been even worse. So I think uh, it's uh, this has served as a wake-up call, a much-needed wake-up call for U.S. defense industry to get us on a war footing uh, so we can produce the weapons that Ukraine needs and produce the weapons that the United States needs, and also to create uh, weapons and build weapons that our allies and partners in Europe and around the world can buy. Uh, so they're safer, so they're more protected. So, you know, Boris Johnson is, uh, you know, absolutely right um, that, you know, we and he's been right for from the beginning on this. Uh, you know, I know domestically in the UK, he has uh, his issues. Uh, but when it comes to the geopolitics, when it comes to Russia, when it comes to supporting Ukraine, Boris Johnson has been correct from the very, very beginning. So when he writes, we should read. When he speaks, we should listen to him. Yeah, and recently I had an interview with us with one analyst. He made really very important project for Ukraine. It calls Protect Ukraine Now. And he told me that the factories, the military factories, they don't receive these orders to manufacture. Do you agree with me? Maybe you have another point of view. You wrote a lot about the military staff in your article. Well, th that is a legitimate problem that the defense industry has. The uh, people are criticizing the defense industry for being slow at uh, manufacturing weapons and and building weapons and and munitions. But then they come back and say, "Well, where's the contract? You know, we're we're not a charity; we're a business, and the government needs to sign a contract with us so we can produce this stuff and get it out the door." So I think there's a, you know, both the, the, the slowness of the U.S. government, but also the unpreparedness of defense industry. I think both of these factors are responsible for the situation we're in today. But it, it is changing. Um, you know, there's a discussion happening here in Washington on providing more assistance to Ukraine, but also allocating a significant amount of money to restock U.S. munitions, U.S. bombs. Um, and um, hopefully this will translate into more money for defense industry so they can ramp up their production so we're better prepared, not only to help Ukraine, but future challenges the United States might have, whether that is you know, more challenges with Russia or Iran or China, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, do you feel about the cooperation, some partnerships uh, between Europe and U.S. in military field? For example, we know that uh, some uh, um, European, uh, uh, some Ukrainian um, militants will be trained in uh, Germany, but using uh, American uh, military staff. So. How fruitful could be such cooperation? This is very important. Um, we often talk about uh, the the sexier items like high Mars and and 155 millimeter artillery and tanks and jets. And sometimes we forget about the people. And we should be investing greatly in training uh, at, at, at the entry level. Uh, the, the entry level recruit helping Ukraine train these new soldiers so they are ready for combat service. Right now, the Ukrainian armed forces is very busy fighting for the nation's survival. Anything that the United States, the UK, Germany, Poland, or our other NATO partners can do to train uh, Ukrainian fighters, um, I think this is just as important as the high Mars, as the artillery, as the tanks. I, I really do. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be that soldier, it's going to be that Ukrainian soldier that marches into Mariupol to hoist the flag. 
you know, it's not going to be done by a drone. It's not going to be done by a jet. It's not going to be done by a tank. It's going to be a soldier wearing boots that's going to do this. Um, and we're making good progress in, in this area, but more needs to be done. Over the summer, for example, I was visiting England and I was driving uh, in an area where the British Army does a lot of their training. And uh, coming down the road uh, in front of me was this Ukrainian convoy with Ukrainian flags. And there were the Ukrainian soldiers who were in England to train. Um, I know that the Ukrainian soldiers will be using the U.S. military bases that are in Germany. Uh, the European Union uh, is going to set up a training mission as well. We should be trained, but, but right now the numbers are too low. We're talking about, you know, a thousand here, a thousand there, 10,000 every 90 days or something like this. We need to be training, you know, thousands every month. Uh, so we have these young men and women ready to go to the front lines uh, of Ukraine and to fight. The also kind of connected to this is the issue of medical care. We've done a lot more on this, but the United States has fantastic uh, military hospitals across Europe. Um, when I was in the U.S. Army, I was based in Europe, and I know that we have these medical facilities there. And you know, we should be working with the Ukrainians uh, in offering to take care of some of your more badly wounded soldiers in these medical facilities. So that way, your medical infrastructure, which is already under great pressure because of Russian airstrikes, a lack of electricity, a lack of heating, uh, your medical infrastructure can concentrate on some of the um, less wounded soldiers or the civilian population, which is also suffering. Oh, look, uh, have been in 2022 in Afghanistan, and uh, uh, you made a lot of work and analysis uh, of the war in Afghanistan. So what I would like to ask you, do you find out any similarities between war in Ukraine right now and war in uh, Afghanistan? Well, there aren't, uh, in terms of the situation in Afghanistan right now, I would say there are very little similarities. I think, you know, right now Ukraine is fighting a, uh, a war of national survival <clears throat> where you, you can't stop fighting because if you do stop fighting, then that could be the end of your nation. Uh, whereas in Afghanistan, the United States chose to stop uh, its involvement there. Was it wrong? Yes. Because first told that uh, such thing, uh, such thing, U.S. Uh, won't um, allow to happen as uh, they did in Afghanistan. We could have uh, the United States uh, could have stayed in Afghanistan um, indefinitely. Uh, it was a, by the time that President Biden came into power, we had a very small military presence there. Only two and a half thousand U.S. troops were in Afghanistan at the time. We were spending $19 billion a year when President Biden entered office. Uh, $19 billion a year in Afghanistan, to give you some context, was what the United States was spending about every 40 days in Afghanistan a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Right? So, and the two and a half thousand troops the $19 billion was never enough for the Afghan government to win, but it was enough to make sure that the Taliban didn't take over the country and then open up the country to international terrorist organizations like we see today. And I think that, you know, the, the, the peace talks that President Trump started with the Taliban I think they were appropriate. I think it's okay to have peace talks, but you have to do so with your eyes open and you have to do so accepting the reality on the ground. And if at some point the situation does not support peace talks, then you stop the peace talks. But President Trump didn't care about any of that. He wanted to end the war. And so did President Biden. So when President Biden entered office, he could have he could have changed everything. He could have stopped the U.S. withdrawal. He says he couldn't, but he could. I mean, for example, President Biden had no problem changing perhaps hundreds 
of Trump administration decisions and policies. So he could have changed the one in Afghanistan. That's the way our system works in the United States. But President Biden chose not to. And we saw the chaos that happened in Kabul um, last year. Now, I think that the road that we traveled on that led us to the invasion of Ukraine, that road first stopped in Kabul. America's adversaries were watching how we withdrew from Afghanistan and they saw weakness, they saw indecisiveness, they saw dithering. And I, I felt like at the time, we will be challenged, we will be tested by our adversaries more than ever because they sense weakness. And so I think, I, I always thought Putin was going to attack Ukraine again. Uh, but I think the timing of our withdrawal from Afghanistan made the timing of Putin's large-scale invasion last February more likely. Mm -hmm. I got you. Yeah, let's move to a uh, situation around G7 and uh, the war without Russia. Because in uh, uh, the, um, this week, we know that G7 is holding on, and many experts tell that uh, the um, talks uh, are around the um, world without Russia in future. Um, as I know that you're um, perfect in um, analyzing Eurasia continent and so on, so how do you feel, like, does Europe now understand the world without Russia? How, what will be the world without Russia? They don't understand it, but they should start thinking about it. Um, it could be a real possibility. Of course, there'll always be a Russia in some sense, of course. But the Russia that we have today, that we see on the map, is going to look a lot different in 5, 10, 15 years from now. I actually think that... Um, what we're witnessing now is the, the, the continued collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1991, people would say the Soviet Union collapsed. I don't think so. I think it's still collapsing. I think that history has the ability to condense time. So 200 years from now, when historians are writing about the collapse of the Soviet Union, they will identify Russia's invasion of Ukraine as the final act of the collapse and perhaps the most important act of the collapse. And I think what we're seeing now with Ukraine uh, delivering this uh, major blow to the Russian military, I think we're seeing the final stages of the collapse and we don't understand or appreciate what the consequences of this will be uh, not only for Eastern Europe, but the Eurasian landmass. I think we could see a Russia that fragments and shatters into a lot of smaller uh, nations. We could see civil war. We could see revolution. We could see insurgency. You have a lot of young men, a lot of young Russian men from ethnic minority groups that are fighting in Ukraine, disproportionately fighting in Ukraine. And they're going to come home someday with no economic future no job prospect, and they're going to wonder, what's my future in Russia? And then I think that's going to encourage separatist views and, and insurgency, for example. So I think it's a, you know, the next five to 10 years could be a very difficult time for Eurasia. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing you told me. So, and um, how will uh, Europe um, already decide are they with Russia or not? Well, there's some, I mean, Europe is uh, not a homogenous group. Uh, you know, there are different uh, points of view, different governments that take different positions when it comes to Russia. Of course, the, faults and when it comes to the government. Yeah, I think there are many in, in like France and Germany uh, who would love to um, find some sort of accommodation with Russia. So we can get back to business as usual, energy, oil, gas, trade. 
Uh, but I think uh, the the majority of European countries realize that it cannot be business as usual, um, that there's been a fundamental shift in the geopolitics of Europe, uh, not seen since World War II. And hopefully the, the policymakers in these countries are starting to think about the best way to deal with this, be looking for alternatives for oil and gas from new sources, looking at new trade opportunities, investing in their militaries, investing in their security services so that they're prepared for what could be a very chaotic, unstable and dangerous situation on Europe's eastern frontier with Russia. But still they receive this gas, Russian gas. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, the, this is something that has to be addressed. Uh, the countries that are still buying Russian gas, they need to work really hard at finding alternatives. Um, America needs to do a better job at increasing our domestic production so we can export more gas to Europe. Um, and we we have to get through this this winter and get through the next winter. Uh, but this will be excuse me to interrupt you. Yeah. This will be much uh, uh, higher price for Europeans to, for example, to get American gas uh, to receive uh, the supply of American gas. Uh, uh, could there be any negotiations, or maybe there are talks about it? Uh, maybe it's not your part of uh, like responsibility, but uh, it's an interesting question. No, of course, I, I think America plays a very important role in the energy security of Europe. Uh, but it's not just America. You know, th there are lots of um, options in North Africa, also in, in the Caspian region. Um, Azerbaijan plays a very important role with this. And there's huge potential for Kazakhstan and especially Turkmenistan to play a role if you could build an interconnector uh, uh, over under the Caspian, connecting Turkmenistan to the Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, the European politicians, American politicians, they should be in Baku, they should be in Ashgabat, constantly calling for this, finding ways to make this a reality. But in America, America has one of the largest natural gas reserves in the world. And because of certain policies pursued by the Biden administration, we've really reduced our production. And if we would be producing like we were during the Trump administration, then we could perhaps lower uh, the costs of exporting our LNG uh, to Europe. The problem that many European countries have, especially Germany, is that they became addicted to cheap Russian energy. And they built their whole economic system, their whole industrial system around this assumption that they could rely on a country like Russia to always be there providing cheap energy. And then what happened in February, geopolitics hit them in the face and now they're stuck in this very difficult situation. But if I, I do believe if there is political will, they can find a solution to this, but they have to really work hard at it. So can we tell that uh, uh, Germany addicted to Russia and uh, to everything connected? Yeah, they're addicted like it's uh, like drugs to cheap, to cheap uh, Russian oil and gas. I mean, yeah, look at the whole Nord Stream 2. The whole Nord Stream 2 issue is a great example of this. It, mm -hmm. It defied common sense that Nord Stream 2 would be agreed, that it would go ahead. It made no sense at all from a geopolitical point of view. Everyone said this, Eastern Europeans, some Western Europeans even, uh, the Trump administration. Privately, mm -hmm. officials in the Biden administration would acknowledge that Nord Stream 2 was bad. And then it took the largest land invasion in Europe since 19, you know, since the 1940s to convince Germany that, okay, maybe it was a bad idea to build Nord Stream 2. Yeah, let's talk, uh, look a little bit about Turkey and war in Ukraine. You uh, talked about it uh, also uh, uh, a lot. So um, how do you estimate the position of Turkey? From one side, Erdogan condemned Russian uh, 
Russian invasion refused to recognize its claims over Ukrainian territories, yes, and from the other side, uh, um, Erdogan offered an economic safe uh, harbor to the Kremlin. Yeah. So does living with Turkey for NATO still come at a cost? Uh, what do you think about it? Well, Turkey uh, presents many challenges uh, for policymakers inside NATO, but I think on balance, Turkey is a very important member of NATO, a very important ally of the United States. And I think on balance, it's it's playing a very productive role in the war uh, in Ukraine's defense against Russia. I think that the the you know Turkey sees itself as having a very important, almost privileged, position in the Black Sea for historical, <laughs> cultural, uh, economic reasons. Uh, so it, it, Turkey sees itself as playing this balancing act to try to be able to talk to all sides in the conflict. Um, but President Erdogan uh, also has an election coming up and he needs Turkish tourism, he needs Turkish money, or excuse me, he needs Russian tourism he needs Russian money because the Turkish economy is facing a lot of problems. Uh, but then again, if you look at the Bayraktars, if you look at the um, the uh, MLRS systems, the multi-launch rocket systems that Turkey has been providing, um, uh, it's my understanding that 60% of the, the winter weather uh, clothing, winter weather uniforms have come from Turkey. Uh, so if, if you look at what Turkey's producing and providing on the battlefield, it's very important to Ukraine. And when I was in Kyiv a few weeks ago, every official, every individual I, I met with, I would ask, you know, on balance, has Turkey been more helpful or unhelpful with the defense of your country? And while they acknowledged some of the shortcomings, they said on balance, Turkey has been helpful. Turkey has played an important role. In, in helping Ukraine. But does it, doesn't it seem uh, like um, um, Turkey as a member of uh, NATO um, disparage even, even NATO when uh, uh, Turkey plays the double game or it's okay for geopolitics? Well, uh, inside NATO, Turkey doesn't present too many problems. The, most of our problems lie in the bilateral relationship between the United States and, and Turkey. Um, over the years, Turkey has played a very important role in NATO, whether that's in the Balkans um, with missile defense, uh, key radar systems for missile defense are based in Turkey. The, there's a major air base in Turkey that NATO and the United States uses. Turkey was one of the last countries to leave Afghanistan during the evacuation. It's also one of the, it's the only other country after the United States that has commanded the NATO mission in Afghanistan twice. So it's, it's, it plays an important role inside the alliance. But there are a lot of problems in the bilateral relationship between Washington and Ankara. Sometimes these problems like spill over into the alliance. But when I look at what's happening with the, the grain deal, for example, the grain deal benefits Ukraine more than it benefits Russia. Um, the prisoner swaps. Who could have imagined that the defenders, the commanders of the, of the Azov battalion, of the defenders of Mariupol would be set free by Russia? Uh, it's extraordinary, right? It's quite an accomplishment by President Erdogan that he was able to do this. President Erdogan's son-in-law is the CEO of Bakhtar, which is the company that makes the Bayraktar drones. It's Erdogan's son-in-law. If President Erdogan did not want these drones going to Ukraine, they would not be going to Ukraine. Uh, so I, I, I think you have to look at things uh, on balance. And, and don't get me wrong, Turkey creates a lot of problems, but overall, it's an important uh, what actor. Problem? What kind of so problems uh, Turkey creates uh, right now for U.S.? Well, you know, uh, as wanting to serve as an energy hub for Russian gas, um, being a safe haven or safe harbor for, you know, Russian business, uh, 
But th these are all driven by economic reasons and political reasons for President Erdogan. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it benefits Turkey that Russia's defeated. You know, since the 1500s, Russia and Turkey have been adversaries, enemies, have always been in competition in the Black Sea region, in the South Caucasus, sometimes in the Middle East. Their natural state of affairs is one of competition and conflict. But President Erdogan is a very pragmatic person, so he's, he sees himself as having this role with President Putin to work, uh, work things that are in Turkey's, what Erdogan sees as being Turkey's national interests. But it's not always comfortable for us, but it's the reality that we have to deal with. Yeah, and the last but not the least, I know that you have three minutes. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit uh, uh, about the situation on the front line. So we know that uh, the last uh, analysis uh, uh, give us uh, the understanding that Russia uh, fortified uh, the occupied territories. And uh, there are a lot of uh, lines, uh, defensive lines around Popasna and around the southern part of uh, Ukraine. So, uh, and on the other hand, Ukrainian armed, form armed force, uh, forces focused on the deoccupation of Mel Melitopol because it's uh, a vital Russian link uh, to Crimea. So, how do you estimate, Luke, uh, the potential for counteroffensive uh, by Ukrainian armed forces? Forces and do all these fortifications uh, by Russia could um, make make harper the Ukrainian army? Well, it does make it more difficult. But right now, the Ukrainian military is on the front foot. It has the momentum. I think we'll see further offensive operations in the Zaporizhia region uh, with the uh, with the ultimate goal of of heading to Crimea to attack Russian resupply routes, Russian logistic routes. Um, one area that is not getting much attention is around Bakhmut, where every single day Ukrainians for months have been holding off huge Russian attacks. Uh, I, I don't understand why this doesn't get more international attention, more international focus, uh, because the, the bravery of the Ukrainians in Bakhmut is something that will go down in history books in my opinion. Uh, but I don't think the winter is going to stop much of the fighting. Sometimes people say, oh, it's going to you know, slow down the fighting. We're talking about Russians and we're talking about Ukrainians. We're not talking about people from Florida. Uh, <laughs> so the, it, let's not forget that Russia invaded in, in winter uh, in February, right? So uh, I, I think that the, the winter months, we're going to see a, a continuation of the fighting. It's not going to stop. And it probably won't slow down very much. Yeah, but uh, what is in Russia? Could Russia use this time when they built all these fortifications uh, to mobilize more people, to um, be prepared for more fights? Uh, and They could. Uh, they, in they could use this time if Ukraine allows them to, but I don't think the Ukrainian armed forces are going to allow them to. And that's why it's important that the United States gives Ukraine the weapons it needs, especially the long-range HIMARS, the ATACMS, the missiles that can go 300 kilometers. We need to be providing these weapons to Ukraine so they don't allow the Russians to rest. Yes, yeah, so I believe that we will get more weapons, Luke, uh, and uh, we will fight for it, uh, and we will fight with Russia to to win this war. Thank you very much for this interview. And uh, also, I would like uh, to, I, I'm grateful as Ukrainian um, for the help Ukraine, uh, uh, US uh, sent to Ukraine. So yes, we would like more, but uh, without that help, we won't get the results we have right now. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it's, it's my honor and pleasure and glory to Ukraine.